Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, that was a great uh, presentation from uh, Mo Ibrahim that we just uh, witnessed. Um, I want to uh, begin now uh, our next panel, looking at uh, building decarbonization into your business model. Uh, obviously, the sort of the change in the business environment over the last several years has been uh, extraordinary in terms of uh, mandatory reporting and, potential, um, and potentially stronger schemes from a regulatory perspective, technological change that's really sort of disrupting the way that firms are doing business, and new partnerships and new ways of sort of organizing our business to address the uh, green transition. This panel is going to explore how business leaders can prepare their economy to move forward into the net zero future. Uh, I'm Matthew Oxenford. I'm a senior analyst at the Economist Intelligence Unit focusing on climate policy and I have a great panel that's going to spend the next 40 minutes uh, exploring this with us. Uh, our speakers today include uh, Pia Heidenmark cook the Senior Advisor at Teneo, uh, Michael Wheeler-Wyatt, <laughs> Director of Chrome Enterprise uh, for MIA at Google, uh, Leila Ertur, the Global Head of Sustainability at H&M, <laughs> Stacey Kauk, uh, Head of Sustainability at Shopify, and last but not least, uh, Julie Gosvalez, the Chief Marketing Officer at Climeworks. So um, just to kick it off, uh, with, uh, I'm going to start uh, by opening the floor to Pia. Um, as a senior advisor that works with governments and CEOs around the world, you have a very sort of good sort of uh, vantage to set the stage for us in terms of what you see the existing conversation being around boardrooms and how seriously they're taking the commitment to decarbonization and a real changing of a business as a, a real change in a business model and not just sort of a, a something that they're doing for stakeholders or to uh, respond to market pressure. Do you think that that's how, how to what extent do you think that transition is already underway? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on which sector you're in, which geography. Uh, and who's in the room. Um, so I think uh, Marie and Thomas were talking about all the good progress we're making with <coughs> thousands of companies signing up to science-based targets. And uh, of course, all of these commitments that everyone is doing, we, they will be held to account. So mm -hmm. I absolutely see movement across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, but I unfortunately see still quite a lot of companies that mm -hmm they're pressured from the outside rather than having internalized it. So the driver is not really coming from purpose or from business opportunities. Mm. Um, they're not really there of wanting it. It's more, mm. um, I want to get a great rating. So I've been in meetings where I can't help myself saying, mm. so that's the driver, you want an AA rating. That's not really going to get you through this huge amount of work uh, to get, become net zero. Uh, or legislation breathing their neck, being worried. So I think more companies need to put it really at the core of who they are. The, it's not about where you spend your money, it's how you make your money. And I unfortunately think that a lot of companies still need to make that transition. But having said that, compared to where we were five years ago, it's still a tremendous change. So it's going in the right direction. That's good. Uh, sort of building off on that, uh, Michael, you're at Google, which is one of the uh, earliest adopters of this transition way back in 2017. So you've been sort of at the forefront of this when it was really not something that wasn't ha even had this level. Sort of as a, sort of an early adopter, what sort of successes and what sort of challenges has Google had in trying to actually build this into their business model over what in this space is a relatively long period of time? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by telling a little story, actually, which is my story as to my journey through Google. So I joined Google about eight years ago. I was on the Android team. And, um, and then about three years later, I, I took on this thing called Chrome Enterprise, which was basically taking Chromebooks out of education and selling them into the workplace. And uh, both cloud products, so both products that you know, reside on Google Cloud. So the first thing I wanted to look at was what's Google doing around sustainability within its cloud. Um, and I found some really good statistics out of that. You know, first of all, as, as you said, you know, carbon neutral in 2007. 2017, we, all of our electricity was, was renewable electricity. And by 2030, we got a very lofty commit to be carbon free, <laughs> which, is a, which is a really big um, thing for us. Because we've got over seven products with over a billion users. So you can imagine the scale of the data centers. It is just absolutely phenomenal. And I've actually been in a couple of them in California, and they are immense. So, so making sure that our, our, our data centers are, are more sustainable is, is one of the big things. So, so then I started this thing called Chrome Enterprise, and, uh, and I wondered about a year ago what the impact of 
devices, the 500 million laptops and tablets that are manufactured every year in this world, what's the impact of that on, on, on sustainability? Um, and I got a couple of analyst customers in, uh, companies in to have a look at Chrome Enterprise specifically because end-user computing is 1% is, is of the global emissions out there. So these 500 million devices actually have a huge impact. The impact that they have is the same as having a forest four times the size of France every year being knocked down. That's the impact of all the devices that every single person in this room uses. So I did this, I did this and, and, and got these analysts to look at Chrome Enterprise as a product to see if they were any different from the other devices that were out there, from the other, the other, the other vendors. And sure enough, we found out that the average Chromebook is about 46% energy efficient over a, over a, um, a, a, a competitor's device. Mm -hmm. So I went to my VP and I said, hey, we're onto something here. Actually, Chrome out of the box is a really eco-friendly product. And he went, mm, greenwashing, not too sure I want to go down that road. Try and, give me some, try and get me some real life examples of that. So I, my team went out there um, about a year ago. I got an external... Um, vendor in, in, uh, in Dublin to go out and, and make some appointments for us. So I asked them to go onto LinkedIn and look for people with sustainability in their title. So decision makers with sustainability in their title. This was a year ago. They found 450. Go back onto your point. I got them to do the same exercise two weeks ago. They found 2,750 people like you with sustainability in their title who are making decisions based on sustainability, which includes the devices which they buy and the devices which they procure. So, so it's amazing. It's actually really, the, the journey is really, really starting. So I'm really passionate about this. And I've actually now got four or five customers who have bought Chromebooks purely because of that sustainability story. So I took that back to my VP. My VP went, oh, right, you guys in Europe, you're a little bit more ahead of us than we are in the US. But, but, you know, make this a thing. Go out and tell the world <laughs> that not just Chrome, you know, sits on the greenest cloud, but also that Chrome devices are actually really, really, really sustainable. So the good news is that all of the prospects and the customers I'm now talking to, it's become a conversation. So one of our big prospects, as an example, is a huge bank. I won't say who they are, they're here, but a huge bank. Um, and we spoke to their procurement um, department a couple of weeks ago, and I said... Why would you pick a vendor? What, 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 what are the reasons for you to pick a new vendor? And they said 33% economic, so you've got to be cheap. 33% technology, you've got to be a technical fit. 33% sustainability. That's a major corporate bank in Europe saying that I'm not going to buy from you, Google, unless you're sustainable. That's how far we've come in the last 12 months. So hope that answers it. Great. That's a very sort of... Uh, striking story of progress from where you, uh, where you were at the beginning to where you are now. Um, sort of moving on a little bit, I uh, just want to talk to uh, uh, Layla a bit about uh, H&M and sort of uh, comparing and contrasting with Google. Obviously, as a fashion and apparel company, uh, some of the challenges that you're going to be facing are very different, uh, particularly around sort of the life cycle use of the products. How do, you see, um, uh, how do you see that posing sort of unique challenges that are sort of different than uh, what you might see in something like what Michael's talking about? I would like to start saying that we are one of those thousand companies who applied to science-based target institutes and approved our climate working model. But we are one of the few companies who put our carbon emissions next to our revenues. Last year, we came up with our goal by 2030, we would like to double our revenues while halving our emissions. That put emissions basically core of our business, because we would like to make sure that while we are growing, we are also contributing to climate. Doing that, of course, we have to look into product, supply chains, and our consumer facing, and we have different challenges to manage all these are when we are working in this operating model. If I talk about product, I'm working with textile around 22 years. If someone asked me 10 years ago, what do you think about textile to textile recycling? it was almost impossible to find a facility who can help us with that. Now it's becoming real. We had Hong Kong Rita working with us for a machine. Basically, you put your old clothes one side, you get a new yarn, other side of the machine. This was an enormous step on recycling where you have the biggest emissions created in fabric dyeing. 
then of course we have to invest on further scale up as H&M, supporting new type of fibers, renew cell, infinitive fibers, or all other innovative fibers with the low emissions is amazing. But of course, it comes with the challenges. You need to be part of this. You have to commit on that. You have to invest continuously. If I go to production part, where we have 60% of our emissions, there are a couple of things that we can discuss about challenges. Last year, when we look into where we have biggest emission happening, it was fabric dyeing, because there you have very coal-based production, where you get biggest emissions comes out. Then we said we will stop onboarding any new supplier who has coal boil on site. The moment you take these decisions, of course, you limit uh, yourself quite a lot when it comes to your sourcing scala. But that we have to agree on this, we are taking this challenge and continuously working with the partners who think like us in transformation to renewable energy models. 2021, we came up with a, our own innovative idea. Uh, we sold 500 million euro worth of sustainable linked bond where the bond will create a funding on the climate actions in our own operations. Mainly, we are going out to our suppliers and saying that if you have a coal boiler in your facility, if you want to change to another more positive operating energies, this could be solar thermal, this could be renewable energies, we would like to fund this. And the reverse of this funding is only, not only money, but it's only with the CO2 reductions. So we have trying to be quite creative ourselves to find solutions. But of course, it doesn't end there. Then you have your consumer facing. We have our way of reaching our customers. And when we look into that, um, we have promoting quite a lot resale. Resale is a business model, which is quite growing quickly if compared to five, six years ago, but still needs a lot of push. With working with Resell, we invested a company called Selpi a couple of years back, and now we have Selpi, which is the Resell platform operating in 25 different countries. This is a small piece of our business, but this is something we have to continue in investing and making sure that that becomes an integral part of our business. This continue with renew. Uh, uh, rentals, this could be with repairing, so we have to multiply our traditional business model with new ways of reaching our customers to make sure that we don't only act on innovative fabrics or carbon-free free production models, but also we are reaching our customers in different ways. When we put all these three together, I believe we have a good modeling moving forward with a lot of challenges, but also good positive way that how could we be a grow company while also halving our emissions. Working with the industry players, working with governments, working with other brands is core part of all these challenge, uh, solutions all those challenges. That's great. And I think part, the question of partnerships and how that's going to play out is something I think we'll get back to later mm -hmm. in the panel. Um, Stacy, just to sort of, bring, uh, sort of uh, bring it to you and to Shopify, obviously Shopify's net zero commitment is uh, markedly different than uh, the previous <laughs> uh, members on the panel, but you still are sort of being very bold on sustainability. How do you see that squaring and how do you sort of set yourself targets that you think are sufficiently ambitious without setting a, a net zero target? Sure. So maybe I'll start by explaining what our business is about. So we're a legal, a legal, a leading global commerce company, and we build trusted technology to start, grow, market, and manage a retail business of any size. We have about 10,000 employees worldwide and millions of merchants that use our technology in over 175 countries. So we decided back in 2019 that we wanted to become a carbon neutral company. We did all of the data gathering, the accounting, and we crunched the numbers. And then we were like, oh, well, we need to be accountable for all of our historical emissions. Let's go see what we can do. And then it was like, oh, well, we can buy an offset. Well, what's an offset? Oh, we're just going to pay this other profitable business some money to not pollute as much as we just did. And that didn't square very nicely. We actually wanted to delete our emissions. And so that led us down the path of discovering carbon removal, those technologies that take historical emissions and pull carbon dioxide out of the air and store it safely. And then we discovered, oh, this is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And also, there's not a lot of this available today. And so in 2019, we launched our sustainability fund and committed to spending $5 million every year trying to buy and support and be that demand signal for the most promising solutions out there. 
And that led us down a path of then discovering it's really hard to spend $5 million because these companies don't largely exist yet. And so because we've already become a carbon neutral company and addressed our scope one, scope two emissions and the big buckets in our scope three, which are obviously corporate travel and employee home office energy usage, you know, as a technology company, we're largely left with the laptops we buy and the pens and pencils our employees use. Like there's not a lot left in scope three to deal with that we can have an impact on. And so what we decided to do was optimize for impact. And when we think about the businesses of our millions of merchants, their scope three emissions are shipping, big time. All of those packages flying around the planet are causing a lot of emissions. So what can we do to kickstart the adoption of clean fuels? Big question. What can we do to encourage the use of renewable power? Well, we shut down our data centers, move them to Google Cloud, fully renewably powered, but that's only our data centers. That's not the entirety of the internet, right? So then we have to push decarbonization of the electricity grid. So we do that through power purchase agreements and trying to build new facilities and provide them with that purchase guarantee that brings more of that online. So rather than focus in on you know, measuring the last molecule of emissions from Shopify's operations, mapping out a nice plan and saying, oh, 2030, that's the year. That's the year we're going to be at, at close to zero as we can. And then we'll go out and buy carbon removal to address all of what's left. But if nobody's buying carbon removal today, there's going to be nothing for everyone with a net zero commitment to buy in 2030. So we're kind of flipping the script and we're trying to optimize so that the carbon removal is available at the price that's reasonable and at the scale we need when the net zero commitments come due. Well, that uh, segues pretty uh, pretty well yes. to, uh, <laughs> uh, to Julie. I think that uh, obviously the role of carbon, uh, of net zero and carbon removal in your business model in Climeworks, uh, which is a carbon removal company, for those who don't know, is quite clear. But sort of looking at this sort of what we've said so far, how do you see sort of the policy and partnership and sort of larger ecosystem that you need as a business to succeed in, uh, in doing what you uh, hope to do in terms of scaling and in terms of uh, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that's in the atmosphere? Yeah, I mean, I think clearly partnerships, right? We, we heard this a couple of times, are really vital. Partnership with customers, I think, you know, no addition needed to what Stacy just said in terms of creating the demand and signaling a strong uh, a strong pipeline of incoming orders for companies like, like Climeworks to build the supply, but also from a policy standpoint, creating the constraint that will drive large-scale adoption of carbon removal, um, you know, overall, um, but as well ensuring that the technology in the full supply chain is actually powered, right? We at Climeworks are solely powered by renewable energy or energy from waste, but largely renewable energy, and we need the infrastructure for this to be built in different places of the world in synergy with storage, right? Um, Stacey explains so we focus on high quality carbon removal, combining direct capture, which is our core technology, with high quality permanent storage. But this facility also needs to be built. Today in Iceland, we have the world largest and first uh, only um, plant, direct capture plant and storage in, in operations today for a year. But that's, that's a full ecosystem that came together, geothermal energy on one end and then mineralization and storage on the other end. And we need many, many more um, hubs like this to be built, which is partially already underway with ambitious program in, in the US with the latest uh, Inflation Reduction Act, but many more of those are needed and today corporate action is really what's driving the signal of that demand and making sure that it grows to the scale that we need a gigaton minimum by 2015. Yeah, I think that the sort of the interplay between the government action and corporate action I think is something we're going to be exploring in a bit in the panel. I want to go back a bit to sort of what Leila and Michael said, sort of have a bit of a discussion before we open the floor to Q&A. You both talked about sort of your the competitive advantage that you see in uh, moving towards uh, net zero, but how do you view sort of competitors that are more of a laggard in this space? Do you think that this is something where you're already seeing the, uh, I think Michael, you talked about orders that are coming in, but do you all, all see that as giving you a competitive advantage against your businesses or is this something that still is sort of coming in the future? I think both of you are in very different spaces, but 
that is that is sort of a, in a in a crowded space like uh, either uh, tech, laptop, enterprise software, or like fashion. That is uh, that is always something you have to be looking over your shoulder around. So, Michael, why don't I start with you? Yeah, good good question. I think most of the IT vendors have got quite a good story already, mm -hmm. um, whether that be us or whether whether that be our competition, which is, which is great because the the market is asking for that. Because at the end of the day, it's our customers that drive us to be more sustainable. If we're being asked to be sustainable, we have to deliver. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, if I could just talk around, you know, if you look at Chromebooks specifically or end-user devices specifically, it, it's like a circular economy, really. It's, it's, it's around, you know, the OEMs, the people that actually manufacture these devices. That's, that's the first thing. You know, they've, so it's not our competition. It's actually the people that, that supply devices for us and our competition as well. So first of all, that manufacturing process has got to be sustainable. Okay, so it's got to. So, for example, some of our manufacturers you use ocean-bound plastics. They use use recyclable materials and packaging and things like that. I think the second thing is then, you know, how are these devices used as well? So, in an everyday scenario, whether that be a, a competitor saying this, or whether it be me saying this, it, it's all around getting all of these companies to think about their suppliers and and how their suppliers can actually help them reduce emissions when their employees are actually using these devices. And I think the other thing that's really, really important, which a lot of, a lot of IT vendors are starting to think about now, is what happens to all this kit afterwards? <laughs> what, what happens when you, when you stop using your, your phone or your laptop? What, you know, that's going to go into e-waste. If that goes into e-waste, that's a really bad story. So one of the things we've, we've done which our competition uh, needs to catch up on, <laughs> in my view, is we, um, about six months ago, we released something called OS Flex, Chrome OS Flex, which basically alleviates that problem because it allows you to put Chrome OS on a 10-year-old laptop. Mm. So instead of refreshing all your laptops or buying from a competitor, a brand new 1,200 pound laptop, you can basically use up to a 10-year-old competitor's laptop and make that a Chrome OS device. So, so different vendors have different, um, strategies if you like but but i think the most encouraging thing is that all of the it vendors are looking at this and and and, and giving all of those benefits to the to the market and Leo, what do you think i think very much connected to your company purpose how you want to work for today for future uh, what i'm taking in from this of course we have to invest we need to spend certain money we have to work with responsible partners that cost definitely i i want maybe we are we are losing competitive advantage for short term. We are not able to produce in certain places, but that should be okay because we know that if you look into our customers in fashion, if I would ask still a lot of store door and ask how much you prioritize better fabrics, how much you work with the recycling, or do you bring your clothes back to us? Five years ago, that awareness was quite low. Now, when we're coming to 2022, we are seeing enormous interest from our customers to learn about what factories we are producing, how do we contribute to women empowerment, how we work with the water. So our customers are getting better and better. When it comes to business models, I don't know how many of you have been shopping secondhand last decade. But now I have my son, and they are continuously in second-hand platforms because they found this very interesting, both from a usage perspective, but also impact. So for me, yes, uh, there is a cost and certain kind of limitations that we have to take now, but I believe this will bring a lot of competitive advantage in long term. And that's been our philosophy on this. We are investing, we are doing business, that's why also we put our business next to our climate goals. We would like to grow while halving our emissions. We believe in. We believe that that theory is going to work because our consumers will be with us on this. So, I believe there are certain challenges, uh, but also this is a great investment for future, more not mid to long term. And one question, sort of to follow up on that, I think bringing Pia back into the conversation. Michael mentioned earlier that Europe, you know, there's a perception that Europe is ahead of cur the curve on this. That cons the publics, that governments, that the society more generally is in Europe is much more receptive and willing to make this transition. Do you see? I guess Pia is you're probably you're probably best place to answer this. Do you see significant differences in how this is going to affect business models in countries that are in companies that are focused on Europe versus the Americas or developed Asia or even uh, trying to expand into other uh, less developed markets in Asia? Or do you think that Europe is uh, not as the reports of Europe being ahead of the curve on this are overstated? I have not done a scientific analysis of this, so this is based on my gut feeling. Um, you don't tell anyone. This, 
definitely differences. Um, I think one of the biggest differences, going back, it's all about people. Uh, there's, of course, technology, there's investments, but it's fundamentally about people and the educational system. And I think we have, in Europe, talked about this for a longer period of time, and we have not made it as polarized and as political. So it's, it's much more around business models and technology and investments rather than ideology. And I think that actually puts Europe in a better place, at least today. But on the other hand, when it comes to circular models and new technology, new solutions, there's a lot of things coming out of Asia and the US because of the kind of commercial drive and entrepreneurial thinking that we have there, which we, we do have in Europe as well. But so what I see is more that larger companies, probably a bit more ahead in Europe, a lot of the solutions of really finding completely new platform thinking, a lot of the startups in circularity are American and Asian, they're not European. So I think we need to reflect on, again, the ecosystem. We need government, we need the large companies, the incumbents, so to say, that are changing. Uh, and we need all these new solutions. Uh, and, and I think continents are, or countries, cities, are differently good at different things. Mm -hmm. But we can't say that if we do the European model all over, we'll solve it because we don't have all the solutions here. Mm -hmm. So I think we need we need all. And Africa, I mean, we had Africa as well. So and Australia now, thank God, are on the train as well. So we're getting there. Yeah. Um, uh, Stacy, as somebody who's from uh, sort of a different continent, uh, do you do you see the same the same sort of uh, optimism from the rest of the world? That's a great question. No, I'm putting you on. Yeah, the that, that's okay. I'm happy to provide the Canadian perspective. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, what is it? On all behalf of all Canadians. <laughs> no, 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 don't quote me again. We're going on gut feeling, right? Not deep analysis. Um, you know, but what I can say, you know, Shopify is a global company and we have millions of merchants around the world, right? And so what we do see are these global trends. And we can say through the research that we have done that 71% increase in customers searching for sustainable products. We've seen that happen. And there are geographies where that is a higher result than others. And we do see that that's something that's happening more so in Europe. However, we're seeing demographic differences. And you can say in North America that the younger generations are prioritizing how they allocate their purchases and their spending. And they want to buy from brands that align with their values. And I think we're seeing that probably globally as well. But the data that we've got, like we do a, you know, a big roundup every year and we call it the future of commerce and we put that out and there's all sorts of interesting insights in there about spending habits and they are broken down by geography. So I would encourage everyone to go there for like the true facts. But um, those are the big takeaways that I've seen. Right. And then, um, Julie, just sort of as a Swiss company with operations in Iceland, um, I think, and also one that's very dependent on government policy uh, to try and create the market that, we, that uh, we're talking about, how do you see the sort of geographical sort of policy disparity between uh, where you are in Switzerland versus maybe uh, potentially uh, expanding and scaling your business to a more, uh, to a larger sort of uh, environment? Well, to be honest, I think it's a, it's a global issue, right? And we won't solve it by focusing on geographies. I think what we do see is sometimes maybe a healthy competition uh, between different spaces. So I mentioned the US before, and then obviously, you know, in, in Europe, we have different countries, Nordic countries being very advanced onto making commitments or actions uh, into getting net zero cities or net, net zero pledges in the, in the coming year. Yes, I think that's really, you know, something that we should go over. We see now a customer base. Today we operate only with a voluntary carbon uh, within the voluntary carbon market. We see, you know, customer from equally US and Europe being largely concerned by by creating that demand for uh, emission reduction solutions, but also uh, but also carbon removal solution. So I think, you know, we are active in all these areas, you know, across across Switzerland, Europe, but also different countries and, uh, and and US to make sure that we have this full, you know, demand, but also infrastructure built. 
Great. Uh, I want to, we have about 10 minutes left, so I want to open the floor for questions. Um, start with uh, the woman in the back there. Is there a microphone coming around? Um, actually, if, if anyone else has uh, uh, questions, I can take... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And Liv, do you want to take that? Just maybe to start, maybe Leila or Stacey? Or sure, Michael? sure. Um, I need to understand a bit your business model, of course, but what comes to my mind first is that I would rather look into the same size of companies sharing my values, trying to club together my power, trying to club together purposes, because I understand it's very difficult and slow to walk alone on this, especially when, when the things, I mean, when you're not in direct control with your value chain. I would rather look into like-minded brands to club together activities. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, you took the, the word right out of my mouth. It's collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think scope three, it's not scope three, it's the scope of collaboration, mm -hmm. because it really is all mm -hmm. about figuring out how to leverage either your purchasing power if you're a very large business and a large brand, or figuring out how to leverage the specific thing that you can influence within your own business. And what is the way that you specifically can have the most impact? And like you were saying, it's, it is often about coming together and combining that purchase power. And that's one of the ways that we at Shopify think about it. Like we have a platform, we have millions of merchants, and we are trying to find ways of taking what we've learned about our emissions reduction strategies, buying carbon removal, and trying to put that out on our platform because what that can do is help smaller brands show up alongside the big brands and win. And so that's one of the superpowers we have that we try to leverage. But I think that every brand has something that they can bring to the table to contribute to reducing emissions. Just adding one more sentence to that. I mean, our competitors in field, our partners in this area. I, mean, I meet up with our competitors, different, not only sustainability, but their business teams quite frequently sharing what we are doing. Because if I won't do that, I will never get enough impact that I wish to. So I would rather look into competitor landscape, how they work uh, in these areas. <clears throat> can I, can yeah, I, can I add to that? Because I think you make an amazing point. Yeah. Generally about sustainability, this is how every single person in this room thinks. How can I make a difference? That, I, mean, I was talking, I've got two daughters, one's 21, one's 23. They're asking me that all the time. They're like, Dad, what's the point? Are we, are we past the point of no return? What can I actually do as a 21-year-old or a 23-year-old lady in today's world? How can I make an impact? And I, th I think that, for me, that sums up everything that we're thinking about at the moment. Forget the fact that I work for a huge company like Google and Chromebooks are 46% more energy efficient than, than a competitor. That's all great. But at the end of the day, it's down to every single person in this room to make a little change, no matter how small that might be. Um, I was reading a story today, not IT related, about mattresses in the UK, right? How many mattresses do you think are disposed of in the UK every year? Five million. Five million mattresses, five Wembley stadiums full of mattresses. And this story was all about this company that is actually um, using a new process to clean mattresses. Um, and at the end of the process, they give them to people that can't afford mattresses. So, you know, even... Things like mattresses, which we all sleep on every day. There are ways for every single person in this room to make some type of an impact, whatever that might be. But I think that's a really important question because that's what the human race is thinking about at the moment. How can we all individually make that little difference? Going back to your point, to collaborate as a planet to actually make things better, which is, which is what we're all trying to do. So, just I was just going to add two things, maybe even more practical, um, uh, hands-on. One is the SME Climate Hub. So find 
organizations that already have brought a lot of like-minded people together because it is also difficult when you're small to mm. find everyone. Uh, another one is if you're working with consultants or advisors, speak up because if you talk about these are my challenges, there is someone sitting with a similar challenge. So not to kind of think that I have all the solutions, no one has the problem because we all, we're all looking into how to do this now. Mm. Great. I think we have quite a few questions, so I'll just take one round. Uh, we have the woman in the front, uh, the man in the blazer, and then just a nice sight line, the woman uh, in the uh, in the white blouse there. And then uh, let's get the let's get the, the last guy in the back just to wrap it up. Okay. Um, thank you so much. It's really nice, um, you know, presentations and and ideas. I'm just curious, as global companies and um, companies that's dealing with. Um, a number of suppliers, both in the um, developed country and also in developing countries. How are you taking social value um, within your business? And how much does it actually rank in terms of, you know, in terms of how you deal with uh, your suppliers and as a company itself? Okay, and then the man behind, the gray blazer there. Hi, um, my name is George. I'm from Birth. Um, we're essentially a company that tries to make climate action accessible for everyone. I think this question is mostly for Leila. Um, have you seen, I mean, there's, a, there's a massive trend of um, companies, retail companies, starting to work on, on climate labels, carbon labels. Um, is, have you seen any push in the clothing and retail industry and, any, and in general? Um, in, try to make this information more transparent for mm -hmm. every single customer mm -hmm. um, so that they can compare that one shirt, for example, the, the cotton comes from Egypt, the other one comes from Italy, and then, you know, like other production and mm -hmm. transportation comes from mm -hmm. further away from China. Um, have you seen this? Is, this? is this in the strategy of your company and, and in your peer companies in general? And then the third question from the woman in the uh, white blouse. Uh, hi, uh, Anna from House of Balkan, and um, so I'm in the same space as, um, as H&M. Um, and I guess the question, as a much smaller brand, is not that different from, um, from the one previous, um, but more geared towards how do you, as H&M um, and also Shopify, ensure that when you are spearheading these other smaller uh, companies and, and, you know, almost taking a stake in them, in what they are doing, ensure that you are not pricing out or um, strategically putting away or creating a space where smaller brands can't access anymore um, unless they go through you or the systems that you have created. Because as a, as a company that is indeed smaller, I think that that has been a concern for us that previously we could go to other small companies and have a, an open conversation with them and um, have uh, relatively early access to what they are doing as well. And that in increasingly we are seeing that um, other bigger players will have gotten there first and we've either been yeah, priced out or they say, you know, maybe in five years' time. And what we are experiencing, obviously, is in five years' time, we can't put that in our pathway to decarbonization. And we have one last question in the back, and then I'm afraid that will have to be it for this I panel. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just had a question because the title of that presentation is about building decarbonization into your business model. But what if your business model is not aligned with the planetary boundaries? And I think that's a question maybe to Leila, where you know the world of fast fashion and the 16 to 20 collection a year can be quite extreme in that sense. And I wanted to ask you, you know, don't you maybe have an opportunity to revive and rethink your business model? that would be more aligned with the planetary boundaries. Thank you. If three of the four questions were primarily directed to Leila on <laughs> climate labeling, uh, crowding out smaller companies and the planetary boundary. I think Stacy, you're also mentioning the other one. So let's start with Leila and then have a quick roundup about prioritizing uh, social value um, in your business model as the, as the sort of concluding remarks. So. Thank you very much. Um, starting with uh, how good we work with the industry, I mean, what we are doing, starting with the product, maybe your question, how do we work with the carbon? Um, we are declaring all our impact on our products. So if you go to H&M Online, 
then you will see this product has been produced in Bangladesh. Uh, this says we use water. Comparably increased or decreased compared to we produced last year in X supplier, most probably. And then you will also see this product em emission has been this much. So we have been working with transparency and traceability for years. So this is not a new thing for us. But what is new, this coming more and more legal requirement, which I think will push whole industry to declare more, hopefully also help us to improve competitive advantage situation. Because we have been, I, mean, I lived and worked in Bangladesh around four years, six years in China. We have been continuously trying to map out our suppliers' impact, funding continuous projects to be able to also understand our holistic impact. Now time come on product declarations, which I think is fantastic. Hope the legislations will push for this more and more. Then you get also all those countries developing, not only because of brand push, but this is how it needs to be happen. So, I mean, from my side, I won't see a problem to talk about product impact. I would love there's more harmonized expectations from everyone to do the same. So I hope I answered your question. And then there was another one. Um, there was on um, the planetary boundary and the uh, oh, pushing out smaller companies. Mm -hmm. um, I actually feel kind of opposite on your question. I feel um, if you look at the industry ten years ago, there was quite major players who mostly like rules to pricing, fashion, quality. Now I think industry even more open to have smaller brands, local brands, local designers. I think social media made a big change. So I think it's actually the, our consumers' preference has been changing. It's not only H&M and XYZ brand who is setting the ground. So I feel more opportunistic, actually. We also started up other six brands different than H&M for different customers customer groups, which we are trying to apply the same kind of way of working in sustainability. So if I were you, I would see this from an opportunistic side, actually, to see. Uh, sorry, I think uh, also you're kind of answering my question properly. I think you are on the right side, right? So, uh, like they said, uh, they are not really interested in the And you can put the money there even though you might not see anything come out of it for a few years where a smaller company cannot. Um, and we're also seeing um, large companies like um, H&M and to a certain extent, I guess, um, Shopify in, in, in a few different areas in their collaborations with um, logistics and so on, maybe taking those stances and occupying a certain space. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps, I don't know if you, you, you might indeed disagree, um, not leaving a lot of space or smaller companies that cannot put that money forward from the from the get-go? We don't have any of our partnership to book capacities because this is not what we're aiming for. The more different buyers come to renew cell, infinitive fiber, or any other innovations that we are invested, it's actually way better if more companies come and help us scale up. I understand your question. Of course, all those startups have limited capacities in the beginning. Uh, that's why also could be a prioritization, but definitely with the time comes, the more buyers' interest, more brands' interest, and I believe they grow in capacity. I think we have a great example with Renew A couple of years ago, they were quite small, was only focusing on one plant. Now they're opening their third plant and really opening up themselves for different brands. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time a little bit uh, for your access to all these innovations. Uh, we have to take, um, we need to use our size and scale to support innovation, maybe do a couple of capsule collection, but our ambition has always been to open up because it's way better for us. Different buyers, different customers at the end sees all those innovative fabrics, which we can also use more in our commercial collections. Thanks very And much. there was last one about oh, yeah, the business a, model, right? Uh, there was one question about the business model. If anyone has, we're a bit over time, so if anyone has something very short to say about how business, the business model is prioritized in social. Maybe Pia, do you want to take that? I think there's a lot of climate talk right now, but mm -hmm. there's also an awful lot, or oh, not awful lot, wrong word, I'm Swedish, not English native, um, a wonderful amount of diversity and inclusion uh, work. So I would say maybe not unequal uh, because mm -hmm. I think human minds, we, we tend to say prioritize, we can't deal with too many things at one time. So we say climate, because that's the one thing we talk about. But definitely, if you talk to large companies, 
the social dimension is absolutely there at par with the environmental. I mean, that's why we have the S and the E. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're uh, over time, so I'm afraid we can't continue, but this has been a great panel. We've had a lot of discussions around partnerships, around, re around sort of the different politics and geography and the sort of the impact of net zero and sort of a very optimistic view of how things may be changing um, uh, in, in the corporate space, although obviously there's still quite a few laggards. So it leaves me just to uh, thank the panel, thank our sponsor, uh, Google Chrome, and to introduce uh, Nelly uh, de Gogu, who will be uh, leading our next panel. Thank you very much, everyone.